Welcome, everyone. Yeah, another Chautauqua. Ah, I can just ease into it, and the sunshine is breaking through the clouds today, so that's a nice symbol. <laughs> we don't know what's coming, but for today, let the sun shine, let the sun shine in. Yeah. Well, we were we were coming over today, and uh, we heard Ivan had a mystical experience. So I thought maybe before we <laughs> we're we're a band of mystics. So it's like, ooh, that's that's our news. We like to hear that kind of news. Everything else is kind of old, but that's that's news. <laughs> so maybe do we have a microphone? <laughs> Deborah's going one in the right right now. <laughs> She's just happy to be here. <laughs> yeah. Um where to start? <laughs> yeah, I feel pretty, like, disoriented today. Um, because I've had mystical experiences before, but this one felt like it was beyond that, even. Um, this is going to sound funny to say because it's impossible, but I, I experienced eternity in bed last night. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I just woke up in the middle of the night, and, yeah, initially it was just from this emotional pain of, oh my God, like, I feel like I've abandoned my family and the usual stuff. And, but then, yeah, I just kind of handed it over to Jesus and, you know, said, okay, I just want to trust this process. And next thing I was lying down and it was like, I was just drawn into eternity. And obviously Yvonne doesn't exist there. Like none of us do. And so all body thoughts, were completely, like they completely vanished because you're too busy, you know, being eternal and all of that. <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> That's great. It's a good, makes it sound so inviting. Everyone's like, yeah. That's how, I want to be that busy. <laughs> I'm not busy enough. I want to be eternally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was like, yeah, it was just this experience of being, yeah, this godly being, like being the Christ and, um, yeah, and it just felt, I just felt totally powerful and limitless and then I'd be drawn back into the body and I could feel my body was trying to scream and um but no noise was coming out but it was just like this like ah like this the body was experiencing a lot of fear and all of the thoughts would come back of being you know Yvonne and like just drawn back into Yvonne's world and then once again I'd be drawn out into eternity and it happened like three or four times and but like I was calling for Jesus when I was having those experiences and I did feel connected but yeah it, I just woke up just in a lot of fear and crying because it was just an experience of a total annihilation of the personality self. Like, just, I I don't exist. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, you know, I'd like to think, oh yeah, I can just see it as a positive and, you know... <laughs> integrate it easily and move on but it's not that experience at the human level like it feels um yeah just like what happened like I feel disoriented and it felt like yeah kind of hard to focus today and um yeah so but I don't know I feel like yeah we all arrived at QDS yesterday and there was such a beautiful welcome from everyone and I don't know, I got all my food whims, like they had pizza and ice cream and steak and 
all of that. And I was sitting in this beautiful house and just thinking to myself, oh my God, I just ended up at this community and it's just so, I feel so loved and supported and, but what's next? And it, it kind of felt like, okay, Jesus is showing me, I can give you everything you need in form. And like Peter ex- described it um, recently, like we have the green light to go for awakening here because yeah, we're not worried about, I don't know, paying bills or looking after kids or whatever you do in the world. So it's like, yeah, um, it just really became obvious like, okay, the next step really is just to give over the self-concept to Jesus and really just keep giving my mind over and just asking, what would you have me do? Because that's where the true satiation comes from and not just like things in the form. And I don't know. So I kind of, yeah, had that realization last like yesterday evening and then this experience happened and but I don't know I guess yeah I don't know I guess I yeah I do want an integration of it and some gentleness and yeah maybe just yeah a way of like dealing with the fear that comes from realizing you're not real and like yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. You're just voicing the prayer for everyone. Everyone's just praying for integration and and healing and really to be carried you know, carried into the light, carried into that vast experience in a in a very consistent way. And the glimpses are are glorious in, in the moment and then then on when their ego kind of sticks them on the on the timeline then they it's disorienting because it seems to contradict so many memories and it contradicts yeah everything that seemed to go before and it just shakes uh, shakes the mind up so it's beautiful because i feel like jesus is telling us in the course he's saying everything that you associate with with goals typical goals in this world goals for the person goals for the personality they're he says very bluntly, they're all ego goals because all goals of the future are by definition ego goals because the ego invented a timeline of past, present, future and then it's a trick. So it's like when, when you set goals and of course he, he does say everyone who comes to this world uh, organizes the world, organizes their perception based on what they believe. And and yet, he also says everyone who comes, comes without a self and makes one as they go along. And that seems so natural in this world to have goals. It's, it seems very unnatural to to not have goals. You know, when if anyone ever feels like I'm done with having goals, then usually there's a chorus of people that say, well, well, you have to have goals. You you can't exist without goals. You can't survive without goals. You you won't make you won't come to anything. You won't make anything of yourself. And so it seems to be the spiritual journey is is just a letting go and, a, and another letting go and more letting go. And and coming more and more into the recognition that that what seems to be very important and valuable, what seems to be defined as success in this world, what seems to be defined as something worth striving for, is part of a trick. It's part of a deception to keep you from the present moment, to keep you keep you from the moment of knowing who you are. There's a beautiful workbook lesson. It's lesson 133, I will not value what is valueless. I will not value the valueless. And then basically, he, in that lesson, he says, you have some very direct, simple 
criteria to help you discern the valuable from the valueless. And, uh, and he's also talking in that lesson of, of moving away from, from high ideals and bringing the student back to what is practical. And that's what these, these dis, you could say, discernment criteria of what is valuable from what is valueless is. It's really the most practical thing your mind can do. And then he says, if, if it will not last forever, uh, it has no value whatsoever. And if it will last forever, then it's valuable. So that's the criteria for discerning everything. If it will last forever, it has value. If it won't last forever, it is valueless by definition. So he's giving it, it's like the nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists. He's, he's putting it into the lesson. So you can see it's more of a convincing task that the Holy Spirit has because it's not about it's not really about trying to gain and it's not about trying to lose, but it's it's again starting to see that that gain and loss, that winning and losing, that that success and failure are are equally distractive thoughts when when they're put on the timeline. So if you try to find meaning on the timeline, then you're left with confusion and doubt and fear. And so it's like being convinced that everything that I have, I already am. Everything that I could ever want, I already am. It's the Dustin Hoffman character delivered that, that kind of line in I Heart Huckabees. Everything you could ever want, you already have and are. And, and yet that is so contradictory to the conditioning to the learning of the world. So, yeah, this is great to hear that you had such a warm welcome and the welcoming foods and everything was welcoming. Uh, tomorrow we have our AI summit at 10 a.m. and then Saturday we're just gonna have a movie day. We're gonna show a movie at 10 a.m., uh, a classic movie too. The Lion King. We're going to have the Lion King at 10 a.m. and then we'll have a lunch. I've heard the pizza party idea again. Uh, and then in the afternoon, maybe around one o'clock, we'll go into the second movie, which is a movie I just saw for the first time. I had tears. It was so good. It was, it's such a good movie. It's, it's, I don't think most of us, maybe maybe all of you haven't even seen it yet, but that'll be a real treat because, uh, yeah, the main character in the movie, he's kind of like, he's like a combination of Gandhi and Mother Teresa and St. Francis all rolled into one. <laughs> so that's what makes it such a treat. You know, you get to watch, and it's not a movie about him. It's basically, he's in the movie. And so, and the characters that are in the movie are all characters. It's kind of like a, a documentary, but it's a movie, but it's it's based on a true story, and they just kind of put it together in the most wondrous way. But even with with Gandhi and St. Francis and Mother Teresa, it would be like if, if you put him on a track and you had all of those three lined up to go to do the 100-yard dash, he would be starting back about 20 yards behind them. He starts off in childhood facing massive abandonment, massive rejection. So he's like, he's like behind them. And then he, the whole movie is him praying and facing every moment and, uh, it's so practical. I, I just thought, wow, this is a... I don't even know if I'll have to even say a word for uh, even setting it up or com commenting on it because it's, it's just so self-evident. Like pretty much any struggle you can think that you would have to face in the world, you know, you'll see him 
thrown with these different situations, starting off when he's just a little boy, when he's a boy, and then and then facing them one by one by one by one, uh, and and the ideas of possibly rejection and abandonment will will come up again and again, and that's kind of the way that it goes on the spiritual journey, where you you know you seem to feel like you're making some progress and then something else cracks and breaks off and falls away or or something that you didn't expect uh, comes. You just get some looks, some glances, some some frowns, an eyebrow goes up from your your partner or your wife in this case. Uh, uh, you know, he has, he'll go through having children and and they basically much, pretty much across the board will think, you know, their friends are all saying he's he's crazy, he's completely lost it. He, you know, his, his church, you know, get out, get out, get out. You know, when your church expels you, you know, that's, you know, you really must be on to something when you get expelled by your church, you know. All the elders of the church, get out, <laughs> get out and don't come back, you know. Because, because I think it's it's just that spark of love and joy and truth in us that that we we have to answer the call to that, and that doesn't fit in this world. This world was made as a defense against the truth, and so what seem to be trials and tribulations and struggles are really not what they seem to be. And in this, maybe you were mentioning the thoughts you had at night in the bed when, when you were coming back and, and also before you went to sleep about the family and everything. I don't think I've ever seen a movie that blazes through that subject. It's like, like with a bulldozer, this thing, this guy, <laughs> he just, he faces the family stuff but that for most it seems like enormous, enormous guilt, enormous shame, shame and this guy, he's, He's like an agent of of transforming specialness to holiness, of special of specialness um, to perfect equality. That's why I, when I think about Mother Teresa, I think of how how gracious and helping she was to you know those around her and the children she met and picked up off the street. You know, and then you look at Gandhi and his his nonviolence and his perfect equality and those deep things, truths that resonate, you know, that that for many human beings are kind of like ideals, like, wow, yeah, great for Gandhi, but, you know, people will say, I'm not Gandhi, or I'm not Mother Teresa, and I'm not St. Francis, and I'm not Thomas Merton, I'm not this, or I'm not that, and then, and yet, that's what the second movie uh, will be also using the backdrop of Africa, just like uh, the Lion King does. So Saturday is going to be Africa Day. Jesus is going to have some fun with us with Africa, <laughs> starting off with the Lion King. I remember with the Lion King, that was the first Disney movie where they had like a collaboration of like 13 writers writing that book. That and the, and that making that movie and that movie has all course of miracles themes in it simba you know he's got some there's definitely some family self concept things going on there with simba and his uncle scar uh his father mufasa his his mother and you could say that's a really good movie too because simba this little uh, lion cub, you know, he, there's a lot of expectations, you know, he's to, he's going to, supposed to grow up and be the king. Uh, that's similar to Siddhartha, you know, Siddhartha lived in a palace and he was being groomed to be the king. And he, he literally had to walk away from it all to pursue enlightenment. He had to walk out of the gate, heard a, a beautiful song playing and left it all behind, only to have to face many things when he left that story. And Simba has to face that too, uh, because he's quite quite young when his 
his father dies, Mufasa, and so he's kind of thrust in a very accelerated way into the discovery or the the search for identity. Uh, and and yet the family system, the person and the the, the parents, the family, is so strongly ingrained and reinforced. But if you're still struggling with that, this second movie <laughs> is like a rocket. <laughs> it's just like a rocket through, through, through the belief in illusions, through the belief in what seems so strongly reinforced in this world. And, and the main character just kind of just uh, takes it one moment of time and it's a great prayer, very deep prayer. So unlike the others that I mentioned, Gandhi was kind of known to be quite religious. He was raised as a Hindu and Mother Teresa was, was Catholic, was Christian. And St. Francis was Catholic, but this is more a demonstration of pray, listen, and follow. It's like you can see it moment by moment in action, so it doesn't have a lot of the, the rituals and the things that are pretty much associated with religion, um, because that's, those are just more things that have to be forgotten too. You know, the symbols, the, the rituals are just helpful stepping stones to let go and go beyond them and go to the vastness. So that's that's exciting. Plus, just a, a day to be watch movies together, watch movies and have pizza, and uh, you know, it's like, oh wow, this is this is this is your life now, as it seems to be. <laughs> when you write home, how's it going? What's going on? Well, it's it's kind of it's kind of good, but it's. Uh, <laughs> What are you doing for the Lord? <laughs> We're watching movies. <laughs> so it's, you know, in one way it's, we have s such a collaboration with the community of, of, of sharing and shining and extending and being transparent and being open and that is so helpful. Even these uh, summits we're doing, the, the summit we have uh, uh, tomorrow is is our AI summit, and so we had our strawberry festival summit. Now we have the AI summit, and 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 in the course of miracles, Jesus says the miracle saves time, the miracle collapses time, and you can really feel it with this the way the AI is moving and the practical applications can happen. Just giving you more of a sense of lightness and spaciousness and allowing your mind to feel more and more just present, not, it's it's basically, the AI under the Holy Spirit's guidance can shrink that mental to-do list that you have, <laughs> that you sometimes think is a giant list, and then it it's just a symbol for, it's okay to let go, it's okay to let go of the, the doer, the doing thoughts, and just to be. So that'll be really beautiful. And then, I, is, is it Sunday we have another one? Is it the Minister's? Thinkific is Sunday. So Thinkific is Sunday, and then Tuesday we have Minister's, and then we'll be rolling it around to the publications and distribution. <laughs> and And yet everything underneath it is just the call for simplicity. It's the call to live a simple life and to be in joy, and to get into the Holy Spirit's curriculum of joy, which is really just really a fancy name for saying, be present, be, be fully present. Be in that state of mind that is natural. Be in that, that instant of, of true freedom, of true happiness that has no limits and, and is free of all doubt and fear. And that's so precious, you know, just to be able to give your life over to that. And then to just trust that everything is being orchestrated, that there's nothing out of place, nothing that needs to be different in the world. You know, we're not trying to 
to change the world, but, but we are giving full presence, full attention to seek to change your mind about the world, you know, to just behold the world as it is, to behold the world without judgment, to behold the world exactly as it is. And that's a choice in the mind, that's a choice that's available, that's, that's salvation, that's, that's the purpose of everything. So, I feel like, yeah, it's, it's beautiful and we're just watching, watching with things unfolding and then, and then with, with the shifts and changes and reconfigurations, there's, there's always a little, it's a little disorienting and it, it can flush some things up because it's like what seems to be the way things were or the way they were perceived to be is, is in flux, but, but really, uh, it's just a call to bring our attention back into into our hearts and into our, the core of the stillness and silence. That's what the opportunity is. We're not really trying to produce something for the world. We're not trying to to have a product. Uh, the present moment is is so free, just as it is. So there's not a need to convince any person or any any one of anything it's more just a, a a stepping back and a surrendering you know it's like this morning i went down and and uh, our cat lucy was down in the kitchen and looking at me and the, uh, she wanted to go to the door i opened the door it's raining she just looks like what's this and then she you want to go out she slowly starts to step back no, and then, then she goes, and then she, you know, goes up to upstairs, you know, to check that door, maybe to see a different, a different outcome. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but it's like, oh no, no, it's rain. No, no, and then there there was the kitchen door, which is has a like a little awning uh, covering the patio, so that it's dry. And then she's gently goes out there into the dry, and then she walks all the way up to the point of where the wet, where it's wet, and just kind of looks at it like, no. <laughs> but it's. It's beautiful because it's very simple. It's like a simple discovery. Just to say, do I feel it? No. Do I feel it? No. I've I've seen her some days though when when the sun comes out or after it stops raining, she likes to walk on water as long as there's something under the water. <laughs> so she'll go walk walk walking on the water, but but that's the way the spiritual journey is meant to be, and that's the way this movie we'll see in the afternoon. It's just taking it one moment at a time, and and with many of the perceptions that that are judged by the mind to be very disturbing, and very very shocking, then it's really a time to take a breath and take a moment, and that is the time to pray, because. There's something inside of us that knows there's always a step, there's always something for us to realize, there's something for us to be shown. We trust in that, we trust that it's happening for us, for our mind. And and even though the initial judgment or the initial interpretation can be quite shocking and horrific, then we we have to move forward. That's where I think faith in God just develops in more of a rapid way when we start to realize that it's always for expanding the faith. It's always for expanding the faith and the trust, and really for nothing else. If we just open up and we realize, oh, that's the lesson for me to expand my faith, to come to know what is not visible to the five senses, to come to have a direct experience of, of something that, that can't be measured, that can't be put on a timeline that can't be analyzed, that can't be figured out. There's a workbook lesson, it's lesson number 13, and that lesson in A Course in Miracles is a meaningless world engenders fear. 
He's saying it's not a hostile world that engenders fear. It's not a fearful world. It's not a, a world of, of disasters or a world of complexity that engenders fear. It's a meaningless world that engenders fear. He's saying for the sleeping ones, that meaninglessness brings up huge fear. So we're used to thinking there are things that we're afraid of, certain people, places, things, situations, but Jesus is saying, no, no, come with me, come deeper. You'll see that it's meaninglessness that you're most afraid of. Some people you could say, you know, that the reason why they get so active with the world and so involved in pursuing goals and pursuing something is because they would tell you, I, I have to do these things and pursue these things so that I can have meaning in my life. But it's actually letting ourselves drop down to that point where we allow the pursuits and the goals to fall by the wayside and we start to realize that that we may pass through something like boredom or something that the world calls like boredom and repetition, but but it's still deeper. It's it's the sense of meaninglessness that engenders fear. It's like you make a space in your mind to let go of everything you thought meant something and you drop down past that and then you make a space in your mind for the Holy Spirit to show you the world in a different way. And in that same lesson, he says, a meaningless world engenders fear because I think I'm in competition with God. So it's the belief in the personality self is the competition with God, because God created us in spirit. And when we identify ourselves materially, with the, the mask, the persona, with the person or whatever, then that is, that's like a, an outcome of the belief in the ego. The belief in the ego is the belief in, that our identity is in competition with God. So that's why in the Bible it was said, you know, that which, which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He's, he says it very clearly in the Course. You know, when, when the body is in your awareness, your mind is gone from your awareness. And when, you're, when your mind is fully in your experience, and your awareness, then there will be no body. Never the twain shall meet. You can't be both. It has to be one or the other. And the spiritual journey is just coming into a, a, an, an admission, a, a surrender, an alignment with I am spirit. That's one of the workbook lessons. It's a very short lesson. I am spirit. <laughs> it's, it's the easiest to remember if you're ready to remember it. It's very short. I am spirit. But that's, that's what the, the willingness to just be there in faith and then let the answer reveal itself. And again, this movie is really good for that because uh, our, our main character uh, is is constantly seeming to face situations and and having to be carried carried through them. So, this is our Chautauqua. <laughs> and as we go through each day with all the seeming shifts and shuffles and everything, then, yeah, then there seem to be emotions that arise from time to time. Uh, it's like the Spirit is kind of slowly lifting us out of a, a, we'll call it an ego comfort zone. And the ego comfort zone was made to, to hold on and cling. Like cling as an, an attachment to something. Maybe as a buffer to something that turns out to be trying to cling to something that's a buffer to the fear of, of God's love. And... And it sounds kind of funny, because it's like, why am I clinging? Uh, what was that movie? Was there, there was a book um, with the the ones, the little characters that were clinging to the river. Um, and uh, 
they were all clinging to the river, or clinging to the shore, and, there, and then there was the Crystal River. Was it Jonathan Livingston Stegall or one of the? It was one of these books, and and they were all clinging, clinging to the to the shore. And then they looked up and they saw a character must have been from further down the river or or up the up the river, just kind of floating by on the. Cr the Crystal River, and <laughs> oh, that's it. Look who flows in and does a little sniff. And all the clings that are clinging to the side of the shore, they go, look, it's the Messiah. Well, of course they think it's the Messiah, because <laughs> it's, it's someone who's in the river, who's being carried in the river, and the rest of them are clinging. And and they're they're terrified, but but the message is, yeah, no, no, I, I'm not the Messiah. It's just, just let go. <laughs> That's the, the message is, just let go. And then when one of them does let go, they kind of get bounced against the shore. There's a few uh, difficult times when they get bounced against the shore, but eventually they get out into the river, and then they're just naturally in the flow. And that's kind of a good metaphor for how the spiritual journey is. You you take your steps. You take your leaps of trust. You're surprised how easy it feels. You're surprised then how relaxed you feel. You're surprised how effortless it is. There's no struggle. There's no push. There's no striving with it. It's just, it's just from letting go, and it seems so natural as well. So that's that's really what we're all about. Here is is just giving yourself permission to do that, to be so used and so in the flow of spirit that you you cease to identify as a doer of it. Like you start to realize you're not doing anything, and you never have done anything. You know, it's a it's a great realization. It's freed freeing the mind of guilt, freeing the mind of of worry, freeing the mind of anxiety. It's just very very easy and very, very natural. So I guess we've got a couple microphones here. If anybody wants to explore anything, we had our big move day yesterday, <laughs> and we're going through all our beautiful summits. If anybody has anything. Kirsten was asking me if I had a way to play music, but I don't, maybe in the future Chautauquas will will set up something like that too, because we, we can we can do that. Yeah. <laughs> they check in with tech support. We can do it. <laughs> I remember we had a, a a retreat at the monastery and. I remember I walked into the kitchen, the community kitchen, and then everybody was so happy, just full of joy. Everybody's just rejoicing in the kitchen. And then I I just got out my phone and started opening up and playing my uh, some songs from the playlist on my phone. And then, that, then it erupted. It was like turned into a dance party. People were dancing on the, on the counters uh, above the... The sink we had, and just I think they recorded it. So I've seen it somewhere, but I don't know. But it was just bursting into joy, just exploding kind of joy at the end of the retreat. And yeah, sometimes that's the best way to do is just to bring out the playlist. <laughs> Our use for words is almost over now. <laughs> Yeah, I feel right now a pain in in my back, and it started this morning when, um, um, yeah, I was in function and I was really with my thoughts uh, with the workbook lesson, and it's a beautiful lesson. Father, your son is holy. I am he. <laughs> And um, yeah, then uh, it was.
was done. Like, I... um, and uh, yeah, that, that first uh, function that really felt good to 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 do um, to be with aligned, and then um, I went to the to the other function, but. Uh, because every day there is a a question uh, for um, what what is your pray into what things you will do that day, and the first one <clears throat> I did, the second one I didn't because it was already time for the third one. So during uh, my third function, <clears throat> I felt like um, this takes very long time. And it, uh, I have all those thoughts that I am very slow with things. Um, um, yeah, I heard that also in my family, everyone is is also very slow with. <laughs> and and then I I um, yeah I, I I I try to stay with the spirit and and ask Jesus. Uh, being done through, but um, I ended up very stressful. Very felt very stressful because it. I, yeah, we were in a team together preparing lunch, and it has to be on a certain time. And I started already a half an hour before the normal starting time because I we experienced also <laughs> this the, the the past days. So, um, yeah, it's maybe a bit of a strange example, but um, I really don't know how to to be okay with this kind of pace I have, or or is it if you're being done through that you going to be quicker with things, or <laughs> I don't know because. Yeah. Well, I don't know. It's maybe, but I, it's it's on my mind. Like all these thoughts, and and, and my family is is slow, and and everything. I mean, what is? Yeah. It's so strange to to be upset over the, something like so little, but it's yeah. Yeah. It's interesting with the slow and the fast thing. I, I remember I was in Holland, uh, where you're from, and I and I did a retreat. Francis and I did a retreat, and and there was a point where uh, it just came out of me, and I said, "Is everyone here ready to be turtles for God?" The phrase came out, "Turtles for God," and people were like, "Yeah, that sounds really good." You know, because it was kind of an interesting kind of phrase that popped out. But but you can see with Turtles for God, there it's like it's like there has to be a sense of of patience, and patience, you know, you know brings you know infinite patience yield immediate results, and the and people laugh at the Jesus putting words together like infinite patience. You know, like what what is he talking about? But there's a, there has to be like a strong willingness to let go of programming. And like you say, if it seems like with yourself or your family, that came up a lot. The passage of time or the judgment of the passage of time. Too slow, too fast, or on time. You know, don't be late. Be on time. Be prompt. It's just, they're just symbols that are being used by the Holy Spirit and Jesus just for mind training. And and still, they're just asking for just like, just let go, just, just have faith, just have the trust, have the patience to trust that, that there are no chances or ac accidents in the plan. Everyone is exactly where they're meant to be. And there, there is no um, chance or accidents or luck or fortunate or unfortunate. It's just coming 
to that experience of let all things be exactly as they are. And so if you start to just see it as that's the lesson, then that gives a whole different context to it. Because if, if it's, it's seen with a, a sense of anxiety or pressure, the push is something needs to be different. And again, you know, we're not we're not here to to produce something like a, in a factory or a, a corporation, and we're not here to try to uh, hold some kind of standard to ourselves and then try to measure ourselves. So I think a lot of the anxiety and the stress uh, and the intensity comes just from comparison. And that is a, it's just an egoic habit. So we're here to break out of comparison. We're here to break free of comparison. It's like when we look at the situation, we're, we're told by Jesus, you know, to see, the, see it holistically, you know, at one point, he has a setting the goal section where he says, you need to put the goal out front. Because if you don't have the goal, we'll say the goal for peace or the goal for truth out front, then things will just seem to happen and you'll look back on them and you'll judge them. And that's the habit of looking back. There's a very famous uh, parable from the Bible about Lot's wife and their their they're all moving, they're, they're escaping, they're fleeing, and they only have one instruction, and the one instruction is, don't look back. And then Lot's wife, she just yields into the temptation. I remember when I was watching the movie, when I was a child, and I was watching the movie, and then I'm like, wow, I just, everybody knows what the one instruction was, and then when she turns back, don't look back or you'll turn into a pillar of salt. There was this salt woman, just <laughs> frozen. That's pretty strong graphics for you'll freeze into time, you'll freeze your, your identity into the past, turn into a pillar of salt. It was striking when I was watching the movie. But that's what happens when we engage in the habit of, of looking back or looking forward. But it's, it's still just a habit of misidentifying and that's what the, the mistake is. So, you know, Jesus says, yeah, you, you know, you don't even want to let your mind get preoccupied with what you shouldn't do, which uh, that's part of what you're describing. I shouldn't be slow. You see how, and then it's, there's something that just seems to take over and then oh, I'm slow again. There's the evidence, I'm slow. You know, but I, it's that shouldn't I shouldn't be slow, and he's saying don't don't live your life. Well, I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't do that. Do only that. Like like put put the torch of your what you really want out front. Let that torch light your day. Let that torch. He's saying when we when we put it out front, when we put the, the goal or the purpose out front, then we will perceive everyone and everything in the situation as playing their part perfectly. That's, that's kind of a, an integration, a holistic view that Jesus is saying, you must see the world holistically to be at peace. You will never see it through the fragments. You will never see it through analysis. You will never see the way the he calls the real world. You will never see the real world through division, fragmentation, analysis. What we were trained in, you know, that's what we were trained in. Our families played that out, our, our jobs, our careers. You know, we were paid to be analyzers. We were paid to be comparers. You know, like any profession you pick, you can see there's there's comparison and judgment in it and then and nobody could even consider being a physician unless you knew the parts of the body and how the body parts interact and the systems of the body uh or being a dentist or or being an air traffic controller you know people are saying no you don't want a blissful 
uh, air traffic controller that can't tell the difference between the planes. <laughs> they would say, that's deadly. We have a movie in our, in our Movie Watcher's Guide collection called 222, in which he, the air traffic controller has a mystical moment. And he does lose track of the planes. And the planes almost collide. And then he meets this woman and, and he describes, he's like, oh, I feel so guilty. He, he had to leave his job and all these things because he, something, some glitch happened and everything. And, and he says, and this was the flight that almost, you know, these were the flights. And, and she says, I was on that flight. And he said, oh my God, like I almost killed you. And she's like, no, you saved my life. You could see the two perspectives. That was her perspective. You saved my life. His was, I almost killed you. Hers was, no, you saved my life. And eventually that relationship becomes a holy relationship where they're able to go past the fear, the conditioning, the past patterns that they're playing out a scene from the past. And again, once again, the scene is looping around and they're getting one more chance to... to break free, break free of it. And so that's the depth of what's, what's happening. You know, you really have to give yourself permission to, you do the lesson, you love the lesson, and now that lesson has to be a torch. You know, I, I am the Christ. I'm going to live like the Christ. I'm going to think like the Christ. You know, I, yesterday I, I watched that movie, but I'm talking about this African movie, and it was interesting because in the morning I got a WhatsApp call, and I thought, hmm, don't know who this is. And it was a WhatsApp call from a minister in Africa. It turns out he was a minister in Africa in the same city where the movie opens up in, and the, the same slums. I said, well, I talked to him later on after I saw the movie and, and I had a lot of tears and it was so beautiful. I said, where, where are you from? And he said, from Nairobi. And I said, where is your church? He said, in the slums of Nairobi. That's the, that's the exact scene that the movie opens up with. And out of the blue, a call from Kenya, from Nairobi. Hmm. That's why I had to call him back <laughs> after the movie. like. And then, uh, you know, called another friend who was born in Uganda and talked to him, told him we were doing these movies. I said, I'll send you the link. Jason talked to him too. Jackson, he's uh, living over in Germany, but he's, yeah, he contacts a lot of us. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah, he, we had a beautiful joining with him and... And but it's there's nothing that's random that everything is just symbols. So I was like, oh yeah, we're getting all these Africa symbols coming in. Looks like a double header <laughs> coming. But but you just take it and you take it in, and you realize, okay, this is just a a belief that I have in my mind, and I'm willing to every day just to hold on to my lesson and and just. Like you were on flying on a, a kite, you were just holding on to the tail of the kite, letting the kite carry you higher and higher. Yeah. Thank you. Turtles for God. <laughs> the food is late. I know, I'm a turtle for God. <laughs> I so found a nice spot there. <laughs> I think I just have like a deep prayer to like let go of the door. Mm. As you were speaking, it was just so strong. Like it's been on my mind like since I was planning the last two events. 
because like you know those two weeks were beyond for whatever I've ever done in my life and and like yesterday felt like that and today felt like that as well like very very full and so many things happening at once and I could see like you know an orchestration of I would finish one thing and then something else would come and like next 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 and like all these different things with the house and functions and like people in the house and everything was happening and I don't know it was like Like, I need to find you and, like, cry. Like, I need to find you. Like, break this. Like, break this thing. Like, I don't know. It just comes up over and over. And, like, I want to find you in this. Like, I was, yeah, with a deep cry inside. Like, I'm not doing this for anything. I'm doing this for you. Like, help me find you. Like this feeling like I need you. I need you, God. Like, really? I need to find you through my projects. I need to find you through my projects. Like, I'm lost. Or that's the feeling. Or what is it that I'm not aware of you? Like, I just want to feel you with all my being. Like, you know, I want to be, like, as you were describing, like, strawberry fields, like, into the mystic like I want to feel that like I'm calling for that it's just like this huge yearning like like Jesus this is not working and I just don't know how to break this pattern or change it or do it in another way and it's like yeah, like the temptation comes like I'm doing something wrong, like I'm not praying hard enough or whatever, or I just start and then I just can't stop myself. And and what was shared by Kirsten and Lisa and Thanksgiving Day was like, you know, they were speaking all about like letting the spirit do it through you and I don't know it was just so beautiful and I felt like oh like that's what I'm yearning for and I don't know how to get there like whatever I'm doing is not working and that's the feeling like Yeah, I feel like Jesus gives us a hint when he says that the Holy Spirit can use anything that the ego made. So obviously time, planning, even tasks and projects are, are of the ego's making. They're not in heaven. But but it's really the, the prayer of the heart is to come into the true inspiration, like to reach that place of such openness and and sometimes it's better even to repeat the thought over and over, I do not know. I do not know what's most helpful. I do not know what to do. It's not as a, a sign of weakness or a sign of vulnerability or gullibility or anything like that, but actually that's that's part of for a lot of uh, you know Buddhist practices, that's just a repetition of I know nothing, over and over and over and over, which seems to contradict all the teachings of the world. You know, people would say, that's a waste, you know, just to say I know nothing. It's, that's just like a waste of time, but that's the practice. But I think that's the, that's the entry point into the inspiration there was a book that was written, I remember when I was in in university, there's a book that came out 
very now it's a very famous book called What Color Is Your Parachute? But it was it was actually starting to get in touch with what is it that you really feel? What what is it that really truly moves you? What truly inspires you? And to let go. Um, I watched a little bit of this. Um, I signed up. I think Foundation for Inner Peace was come had made a new app, an audio app, and uh, that was one of the things that came up on the Zoom call when when people reached a point of of frustration or uh, intensity. Um, Tamara, who's the president of the Foundation for Inner Peace. She was echoing what another friend of mine was saying on the, on the call, which is, just stop, and and do nothing, and and enjoy the the grace and the the stillness of the moment. She was saying to her some of her staff on there, you know, I don't pay you to do anything, and that's why if it gets to a point of frustration, then stop, and pause and pray. And, and let go. And, and that's what the purpose is of the course. You know, and so she was reinforcing that with, with her staff even. And I think that's important because it's like the conditioning runs very deep. You seem to learn all these skills and abilities for a time purpose, for a completion of something, a, a project, a, a completion of a project or planning something making something work out smoothly. And then when the mind judges, like when we went to Mexico City and the thing with the, the man that was paid to be our audio helper, when, it, when something goes way outside the script, it's like, you know, not something that you planned for, something that just seems to be way out of pattern, like things falling apart or something like that. You know, it it takes it takes a few jolts before we start to realize that that is not something in form is going wrong. It's just our interpretation is that something's wrong, and that's always the ego, the ego's interpretation. Something's wrong. Something's off. You know, and then from that one thought and that one interpretation. You know, it just gets, there's fear, enters guilt, you know, shame, all kinds of pressure, worry, concern, just come flooding in that little crack of something's off, something's wrong, something's amiss. So it's kind of like, almost like, it's almost like artistic to, to, to be okay with things exactly as they are and and to to really let that wish that things should be different you know come fully into awareness because it's it's unconscious that's what's so frustrating is when you're saying god i need you I, I need you it's this there's a heaviness there's a there's a weariness it's a fatigue tied into this wish that things be a certain way I'll be happy when things are a certain way, and then things are not that certain way, and then it's like, I'm not happy. How are you doing? I'm not happy. Uh, you know, it's not seen as a choice even. It's just seen almost like it's, unhappiness has thrust itself on me and swallowed me up, and now I'm unhappy. But that's that's part of the 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 conditioning, the thick beliefs. So, what we're really doing is just cult cultivating kind of a, a a curiosity in our mind, like children are often very curious. We're cultivating a curiosity. We're cultivating a, a curiosity of what what is this showing me? What is this showing me about what I believe? What is this showing me about what I'm thinking? What is this showing me about what's going? What I believe is is happening here. And then the prayer is, I need to cultivate that curiosity to be shown. You know, that's, I was very graphic, so that's why I, Jesus finally said, okay, I can, I'll, I'll give you a map of the mind, and it was, that's where levels of mind came from. 
and all of the things we use, spiri and, and instrument for peace and all those things came from the prayer that you're speaking now. Like, I need help, I need to find you. And this was more like the instruction manual. Like, okay, start here. Here's what you perceive, here's what you're feeling, here's what you're, you're thinking, here's what you're believing. Would you rather be right about the belief of the way the ego set it up, or would you rather be happy? Meaning, am I willing to admit I was wrong? I was wrong about this perception. Continuously <laughs> being willing to do that. Oops, wrong again. Ah, sailing along, oh, wrong again, wrong again. Yeah, I, I was wrong about what I believed, what I was perceiving. It was a mistaken perception. You know, it's just, it's not common to question every value that you hold. It's not common to question your perceptions. You know, I remember I started doing a lot of that. I started to question everything when I was in, first I was in undergrad and then when I was in grad school. But I remember when I was in like my fifth year of, maybe that was another sixth year of undergraduate work, that I was so questioning everything. I mean, I was questioning absolutely everything. And finally my classmates would just were like, would you stop? Stop! Stop questioning! <laughs> you know, Don't ask another question. Just get on with it. And I said, get on with what? And they'd say, life! And I'd say, what do you mean by life? And then they'd just start telling me what they mean by life, and I said, that doesn't sound appealing. That's the way it is. Be normal. Come on. Snap out of it. Snap out of this questioning. Why are you questioning everything? And then when I finally, shortly after that in grad school, A Course in Miracles came, and I remember opening up one day, and it said, to learn this course requires willingness to question every value that you hold. Not one can be kept hidden, or it will obscure your learning. And I was like, yay, a cheerleader. <laughs> Jesus is like, question everything. Don't stop. Don't stop questioning until you finally realize the answer, that the questioning is part of it, the allowance for that. But somehow we judge even the questioning. You know, we think it's not realistic, it's not practical. But I think we're cultivating that, you know, you can you can just wake up in the morning over at QDS and you can think, I'm I'm in Plato's Academy and we're here to go deep into the meaning of things, to discover the true meaning, to question. The day is going to just be about questioning, not about doing or accomplishing not about figuring things out or collecting something. It's not about any of those things. It's just a day of discovery. It's a journey of discovery. Like a child that's curious, that asks questions. I always got ex very much a feeling of joy when I, one time I went to see a movie and there wasn't many people in the movie theater and a mother came in with a small child and I don't know how the child was maybe like five years old or something like that. And and during the movie, the child asked like about 350 questions. What's this? Mommy, why did he do that? Mommy, why? Mommy, why? You know, it was good. And, and some other people in the theater, they just got up and left because the child was quite loud too. And this, they were probably thinking, I just spent... Twelve dollars to have a little boy ask three hundred and fifty questions during a movie, and I could hardly pay attention to the movie. But I was actually delighted. I was just sitting there. Oh, this is fantastic! Because I, for me, it was just this. I, who cares about the movie? This was a child in in the curiosity of discovery. And that's what I was excited about. That's what I wanted to cultivate in myself. I said, "Thank you, Jesus, for showing me this." It's it, 
you know, it, you don't think you're going to a movie theater for that, but actually I, I was quite delighted to hear the curiosity. And the mother was very patiently trying to answer every question too for the child. So we had two of them talking <laughs> in, the, in the movie, not just the child. But it's like, what is it for? Are we here to discover something that's maybe been right there for us all along, but we've overlooked it? Because we assumed something. We assumed things should be a certain way. And then, then we go about chasing like a cat chasing its tail, getting more and more frustrated, chasing the tail, chasing the tail, chasing the tail, and then judging ourselves. Like, oh, this is terrible. What a, what a waste of time. I don't think when a cat is chasing its tail, I don't think it's thinking it's a waste of time. It's probably actually, I've seen ISO do that here, just spin around like it's a playful, like a whirling dervish or something, you know, it's a spiritual experience. He's not like, oh, here I go again, I'm out of control, I'm, I'm chasing my tail, you know. There isn't that self-judgment about it, it's just, it's playful. I so, through all the years, has always remained playful, always. <laughs> Linda's like, and people are like, yes, we can confirm, <laughs> this, is, this is the truth. So there's nothing about age and losing your playfulness. I just watched, a, oh my gosh, I watched a, this a little glimpses of this movie that I'd done, I think a couple times. But I did, right here in this room, I did uh, John Lennon and Yoko Ono, Above Us Only Sky. John Lennon is so playful. You know, he's trying to get the music right, he's getting the right pitch of the piano, he wants the sound to be just right, because he's trying to record an album called Imagine that it will be shared all over the world. And that song, Imagine, was voted the song of the century. Not the song of the year, not the song of the decade. Imagine writing a song and singing a song that's voted the song of the century, the song of the last hundred years. And, and yet, when things are just not going and not going and not working, he's... He just finally says, let's take a break. And then he comes and he looks into the camera and he's making sounds and funny faces. Just so playful. That's where the, the flow, the creativity of those great songs that came through came from, was the playfulness. Extremely playful. And they had all this footage in that movie that was edited together, but a lot of it is just... Yoko and John being just funny. They were just just like two little kids. They might as well have been four years old. It didn't matter whether they were in England or New York City. It didn't matter. They were just playing and playing and playing and playing. And and I thought, there it is again. There's There's some kind of an openness and curiosity. When children are playing, they're in discovery mode. They're playing in discovery mode. They're not in, I gotta f accomplish something mode. That's an adult mode. That, and, and that's a mode that's just productivity. It's got some kind of a, a learned concept in there and it's, the, it's like feeding the concept. Gotta get done. Or gotta get done on time. You know, that's another one. Gotta finish it. Gotta get done on time. There's a song he wrote for for his son, Sean, but it, you might remember the lyrics. Life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. Like there's something called life, even while the ego is trying to make plans, that's still there. It's still vibrant, it's still present. And and that is, even uh, in that movie, uh, uh, Julian is, is a child there. He's just running around, I think it's called Tittenhurst, the place that they had the big white house with all the, the like 99 acres of, of grass and, and trees. And he's just running around, running around, running around. 
He runs into the house. They, they're, they're making a studio so they can record Imagine. And he's interested like children are for maybe five minutes. And then he's back out running around outside. It's like, ah, okay. It was exciting for five minutes, but that's, he wasn't interested in it. He was just interested in running in the grass and playing. At that age, he was just, he was really into the play. And I think that's part of it. You, we really have to kind of give ourselves permission and cultivate that playfulness. We have to really cultivate it. Because now when we go on ego autopilot, then that's just the doer. You know, and, you, and it's, it's really quite depressing, you know. The doer is like, it's on some kind of mode, get the job done, get it done. Do a good job. Why should we have to do a good job if we were created by God as spirit and we're perfect? It must be that we need to, we need to forget what a good job is and, and give ourselves permission to do that. But that's really what the purpose of the community is. It's not to produce something. We're not here to produce something. If, if we start to look at something in an analytical way, that's not it, you know. We want to be able to answer anybody when they say, how did you do this? And you can just say, hmm, I, I didn't, I feel like I didn't do it. Or you can even say, I did it intuitively. Because intuitively is, is just from a place of guidance and inspiration. Without a need for, for an outcome. When painters are, are painting their masterpieces, they're just in the joy of painting. You know, it's like Abraham Maslow, the means and ends are together. They're, they're not thinking of a future end. They're not thinking about the painting as, a, as an object. They're not thinking about selling the painting. They're not thinking about how much will I earn from this painting. Because they're gone from the moment if they're thinking how much money is this, will this painting bring. That's commerce, that's reciprocity, that's, that's artists, singers, songwriters, painters, musicians. Even athletes will tell you that when they're in the zone and they're just in the glee and the joy of the moment, it's the happiest time, not when they're thinking about the score. I had to, I had to actually practice this when I, when I was started to get interested in tennis. I did find a, a good friend who was into spiritual enlightenment, he was into Kriya Yoga, he was into Yogananda, so I was practicing The Course in Miracles with Jesus guiding me, and he was practicing Kriya Yoga with uh, Yogananda guiding him. And then when we got in the tennis court, we would, we would not keep score. We would go out there to truly play, to truly be in the moment, to we were calling on, God, I need you. I need, to, I need you. I'm not here to keep score. We did not play games. We weren't interested in, in 15 love, or 30 love, and 40 love. We weren't interested in deuce. We, we, weren't, we were interested in love, divine love. <laughs> and we weren't interested even in the scores, which were called love. Love meant zero. Yeah, that's... That's when you try to put love on a timeline that you make it into a zero. It, you don't you don't let it be what it is. So it it is very opposite of the world. But then again, that's that's what we're giving ourselves over to. It's good to remind yourself of that too. Like, oh, another day of discovery, not a day to finish the to do list. You know, it's not a day to accomplish something in form. It's a day to discover the truth and and to allow ourselves to question everything that is in our mind. It's all right to actively question things. I think it's a, it's actually healthy. I think that's that's how we come closer to dissolving the questions or letting the spirit dissolve the questions. But first, we have to. We have to allow ourselves to question. Hmm, I'm not feeling good. What do I believe here? What am I what what outcome am I searching for? Am I willing to let go of that outcome? Am I willing to let go of that outcome and still feel loved and accepted? 
you know, still feel loved and accepted. We had someone who was just applying to come back in the community and then we were just sitting down, was it just a couple hours ago, and it was like the message came in, no, I'm not coming. Okay. <laughs> so, there it is. You know, it's like, let all things be exactly as they are. There's, we're not trying to grow the community, we're not trying to shrink the community, we're not trying to have a certain... Uh, number involved. The, I always think of that Mother Teresa documentary where she was there with all of the sisters, all the nuns, and she's giving them this talk on their first day. They've just cut their hair, put on the habits, their uniforms or whatever, and she's, she's like saying, I'm not into numbers, she says, <laughs> very like firmly. I'm not into numbers. And she says, we're here to see the face of Jesus in everyone that we meet, every child we pick up. It's like a good, strong, this is my purpose. And that was fantastic. You know, you could tell by the way she lived her life, she wasn't into numbers. She wasn't trying to save people or save souls. She was praying to, to know God. <laughs> she was praying to see Jesus in everyone that she she met, and then it, there's a letting go of expectations. She was she was not trying to, you know, lead a community. Even I think she was just really, honestly, just trying to get in touch with knowing God, you know, in a very sincere way. That doesn't fit in the world. But remember, we're not of the world. We're being called out of the world. We don't have to fit anymore. We don't have to try to fit in. Uh, even even that our trip that trip to uh Mexico City yeah it was there was just a, filled with opportunities you know that's the only way to look at it with the smile on your face like oh lots of opportunities there lots of opportunities to let go again it was a letting go of thinking things needed to be a certain way to for there to be joy but joy isn't dependent on outcomes. Joy is just, it's, it's, it's a presence in and of itself. And the Holy Spirit is the spirit of joy, and the Holy Spirit's curriculum is the curriculum of joy. So that should give us a clue. If we're not feeling joyful, then it's better to just stop. You know, a lot of us have been told, push through it, push through it, <laughs> like we you know. But, but actually, it's, we could question when we don't feel happy, we can start to question, we can go into inquiry. You know, that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. And look around, everyone is in it with you together. You're not, when you struggle, you're not letting anyone down, you know, because everyone is in it together. We're all in this together. We all have a very deep purpose. We all can afford to pause when things aren't working. Pause, stop, put on some music. <laughs> take, a, take a musical interlude <laughs> instead of the old way, which is try to grind it out or, you know, figure it out or push through it. You know, we're, we're not, we're, we're here to let go. So thank you. That's it. That's that's. I know for everyone, your, your prayer is everyone's prayer. That's why we have the ISOs. Just <laughs> yeah. Tails just moving softly, like, oh yeah, this is good. Yeah, I just want to say, I think it's so beautiful because when you said, God help me, you know, that's really, I feel like it's our life, like God help us all, you know, it is that constant prayer. When you said that, we all felt that it's this continual relationship with God every day. And we say, God help us. And when you say it, and when you said it, I just, I don't know, it's like every prayer is 
being answered and we're saying that together, that it is that God help us, like your longing of your heart. I can feel the longing of your heart and just, it just that I just feel it deeply when you were saying it just, I feel joy with you in that. God help us, you know, continually. And, you know, just even the projects and all, you know, the different summits we have. I know for myself, that's just all I've constantly done is just every day, you know, I give it to you, Holy Spirit. It's the mind training to continually, you know, not just say that, but, you know, practically to do that. It, we want to be done through. We want an experience that we can step out of the way. And to really fully invite the Holy Spirit in and say, okay, Holy Spirit, I'm going to give this to you. You know, everything that we're doing, you know, we want to do it to remember God. I want to do this in remembrance of you. Everything, whether I'm brushing my teeth or whether I'm working on an event, it's all the same. Because let us do this in the remembrance of God. And that's the longing of our heart to feel that connection. And that's the only purpose. It's like David was saying, our purpose is so high. We have a very high purpose here. It's very high calling. It's not about the form. It's about the purpose that I know for myself, that's all I know to do, actually. And then it becomes natural. It's like we run and then that's and when we are feeling that exhaustion, it's like what Jesus says, you know, discomfort is only aroused for the need for healing. Okay, I'm in discomfort. I need to stop. And I need to get still. And I need to consciously, you know, hand this over to the Holy Spirit now. I know for myself that's just what I did. Every day, you know, even resistance or whatever, it was just I was doing this to heal my mind, to remember God. It's the only purpose. There is nothing else that we're doing. So it's, these are the means, like the projects are the means for the purification of the mind. It's really understanding that that's actually normal. You know, right now we're in such a transition and... You said, David, that we would not be, like, it would take till January. And during that time, you know, it's like there is so much healing. It's like a purification is happening. We're in massive purification. And that's why even these Chautauquas, that's what they're about. They're for us to feel connected together and that we're not alone and that allowing these thoughts and beliefs to come up to the surface and give them to God and say, okay, God, help us, you know, to answer the prayer of our heart. But it's, it's for us to feel that connection to God together and that we don't have to keep it up, you know. Like if it's, we're trying to keep up some graven image, oh, it's, it's, it's terrible, it's horrific. I want to be authentic. I want to be, I want to be, I want to be in an authentic experience. Every one of us have devoted our lives, you know, to this purpose. And it's like, I want to, I want an authentic experience. And so if I'm feeling whatever I'm feeling, I'm allowed to feel that. And that's what I need to, that's what I believe is real Holy Spirit. I'm going to hand it to you. It's like this daily begin again. Today I begin again. Today is, I do everything in remembrance of you, God. Everything, let me remember you. Let me feel your presence while I'm scrubbing the toilet or cooking or I want to feel the joy of the Spirit. I want to be filled with thoughts of joy with the Holy Spirit. I want to lift these thoughts up that just do not longer serve me. I want to experience your presence in my whole being, God. You know, that's what's going to satisfy us. And that's what our whole community is about, is just, that's it. And we get to begin again, begin again, and just, yeah. 
I just feel like when you said that, I just felt like I wanted to burst out crying. I could feel it around the room, you know, that everybody's saying, help me, God. Help me, God. So thank you. I get to talk about God. <laughs> Yeah, the ego's always like, always telling us, you better be good, you better be, you better be enough, you better be worthy to be included in, in a community, in a relationship, in whatever. It's always got to fuel its own doubt thoughts of, you know, have to live up. We're trying to live up to some kind of standard where we feel we're going to try to make ourselves worthy. Just watched that Yogananda movie and this, he was living on, I think it was called Rosemont or something like, what's Rose, in this, on this hill with this big house in California and this guy came to him and, and he just kind of came up to Yogananda and he said, I want to, I want to come and be with all of you and all of the people that are around you. I want to live with you. And, uh, he says, but I don't know if I if I really qualify and everything. And so Yogananda listened to me, and he said, uh, he said, I I do drugs, I do drugs. Uh, you know, is that is that okay? He's, Yogananda said, yeah, it's okay. it's okay. He said, and I and I smoke. Uh, is that is that going to be all right? You know, yeah, that's okay. That's good. I I'm into promiscuous sex. Uh, you know, is that gonna be all right? If, can I come and live with you guys and everything? And Yogi nods. said, "Yeah, so is it. So it is." He said. Then finally, Yogi Nanda said, "But if you do come and live with me, I cannot guarantee that these desires will stay with you. They may fall away." Is that okay for you? <laughs> There's love speaking. Love's not trying to take something away. It's just saying, yeah, come as close as you want. But I can't guarantee that, that you, these desires are going to hang with you. Don't be surprised if they fall away. That's, there's a, that's what Jesus is giving to all of us. He's giving us the welcome. He's not... He's not judging how well things are going. He's not judging our product progress. It's not like that St. Nicholas song. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. You know, <laughs> you know that's like having a presence over you like, ooh, better not make a mistake here. Could cost me too much pressure, you know. This is more, come, come. You know, even when you've broken your vows, when you've judged yourself as a failure, and you've judged yourself as, as, as not worthy, come, come again. Rumi always said, come again, keep coming again. Come again toward the curiosity. Come again toward that innocent child that just questions, questions things, doesn't, doesn't take them on. I can't remember. There's a t there's a show on that I just heard about. I think it's called Young Sheldon. Has anybody heard of Young Sheldon? But it's this. It's this, it's a series. I think it's going in this fifth season now. But it starts off with maybe this like six year old who has no filter. He is just a little six year old, no private thoughts. He doesn't. He will say anything, ask anything. He does not shrink from anything. He goes, he goes into church and and he starts. He's asking questions in the pews, and the elderly lady in front is like turning around every time he says something that she thinks he shouldn't be saying. And he, she turns around and she just glares at him, and he goes hi, and then he, and then he continues on. Like, he doesn't miss a beat, he just says it. So, I just saw a little snippet of it and I thought, oh, I think I'm going to have to watch the series. Because I think it's in its fifth season, Young Sheldon. And and there it is. He's 
He's, he has no filter. And he has a twin sister, and she really has no filter either. So the, together, it's kind of like, it's very comical, because they're just letting fly with the thoughts. And the mother is a, a bit protective, but, but she's trying to protect young Sheldon out of love, even though it's very difficult. Protectionism is always hard when we try to protect something, anything really. Jesus tells us, in, your, in my defenselessness, my safety lies. He's not asking us to fall into ego protectionism. But it's, there's something refreshing about that. And that, again, that's what this community is about. It's like, that's what the Chautauquas are about. It's like, bring it up. Ask the questions. Bring up the things that have been churning in there. If there's like a doubt thought that's like a, in a tumbler, in a dryer, that's just tumbling around and you're thinking, I wish it would just stop the dryer here, stop the tumble. But, but we, don't, we don't stop the tumbler when we try to repress it and just push it out of awareness and think, I shouldn't be thinking this or I shouldn't be feeling this. That, that's not the escape from the thoughts. There has to be an allowance, like Yogananda was was treating this man. You know, he was just so welcoming with it all. And I think the man did eventually did come and did go through a, a transformation, a purification. But he wasn't turned away because of something in form. He was welcomed. And and Yogananda welcomed him with great confidence, like great confidence knowing that he would he would drop these egoic things that were still in his mind because yogananda was had done, done it himself so he was confident he was just kind of encouraging everybody to live a devoted life to keep their attention on god and he was giving an example of that too not not embarrassed about things, not self-conscious about things. You know, coming over from India to the United States in around 1920, in the in the 20s, you know, it was the same ego world that that seems to be right now. The same things are going on. This from the ego's perspective of the prejudices and the the racism and. And he had to face all those things, <laughs> coming over to Boston, wearing a long robe, a long orange robe, and with long hair down, past, way down past his shoulders, you know, and, and a dark-skinned man, you know. That was, it was a perfect setup for him to stay open and curious and say, God, you're first. I'm here because of you. I'm not here for anything in form. I'm not looking to try to make something happen or do something in form. I'm just here to I'm here to know you. And then it's amazing. That's what this movie is that we'll that we'll watch uh at one o'clock on on Saturday. This is gonna be the same thing. You're gonna see this just this wow, this deep devotion. But underneath the devotion is God, I want to know you. I want to know you, I want to serve you. I want you to show me the way. That's the prayer. The unspoken prayer is there, very strong. And then you get to see all the things that that he gets carried beyond. Just through the prayer. Just through the prayer of his heart. It's, it's not like he's not like he's loaded with skills and abilities to handle these things. He, but he has a prayer. Like you were just saying, God help me. God help me. That's the prayer. That's just wonderful. We're just basking in that. God, I look to you. Oh, I still like these shiitakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I think was. What's been coming up for me again is it's like it's like the next wave of family guilt and yeah, 
Yeah, I don't know. It just seems to be like the most sensitive area to me every time. It's like I've never experienced guilt like it until I came to community and this guilt seemingly around the family roles and um yeah it just I don't know this the, the the feeling of guilt just seems so intense and yeah it's just been like it's like every couple of months there's like another big hit and one of them just kind of came recently and you know it's kind of, it was kind of around like sensitive areas and kind of value system of the world like one of the things I was kind of called out on was like oh you didn't text on the day of someone's funeral and you didn't ask me how I was when I was sick and, and things like this and just and it seems like yeah there was this seeming flush up of guilt but I just had like no helpful response come to mind because every kind of response my mind was coming to was either attack or defense in some way it was kind of trying to explain myself or or try and prove myself right so I just had to choose to not say anything at all and you know I was praying and then nothing was coming so I thought that must be the answer but then I was called out on that but I trust that it was you know I was just trusting intuitively that, that seemed like the only sane choice but so now the guilt feel was even more compounded because now my driver's license is running out and now it's like, oh, now I need to reach out to my mom and organise that somehow. And then it feels like this, yeah, like the belief in my mind is like, oh, now, like, yeah, like I've turned my back on her and then it's like, now I, now I want to reach out when I need something from her. Like, that's the kind of guilt that's playing in my mind. Um... And, and I saw a belief today, you know, when I was journaling about the situation, like, I believe that, like, she gave me everything and now I've turned my back on her. That's what's coming up. And, you know, I, I can see that's what the Course is trying to teach us. We believe about a relationship with God. You know, we was given everything. And we turned our back on God and now we're, we're guilty, but not kind of in touch with that on the deep level. But, yeah. I don't even know what kind of question is, but um, yeah, I guess it's just a prayer because it's just like I have no idea what to do. You know, even though I seem to have been through waves of this, it's just every time it just seems like something different somehow, and I just feel kind of paralyzed. Like I have no idea what to do, but my mind keeps cycling on on this guilt. Yeah, you're, you're going to eat up this movie. Oh my gosh. This <laughs> Jesus is sending in this movie at one o'clock and you're just going to be like, oh my God. Because it's all based on, on joy and insights, you know, the main character. When he gets an insight, he immediately gets it so deep that it just radiates off across the whole world and and he will he will have this massive insight and then he'll go right to his family at the family dinner and sit down with them and it'll just come flowing out of him and the looks on their faces like they're just they're dumbfounded and he's got such a big heart that he starts to love so many children that his biological children are very uncomfortable. They feel very excluded. They feel very neglected. And they feel that he's gone crazy. He's got such a big love. It's so explosive. It's like a Jesus love that the, the biological family, his wife is raising her eyebrow, the kids are raising their eyebrows. They're like, what happened to you, Dad? Are you just crazy now? Are you just lost it completely? And he hasn't lost it, he's found it. He's found it. He got, he got into it, he felt it. And then he would just say the most natural thing, like, you know, like he sits down with them, and they're all, it's just a typical family, they're all munching and everything, and he's like, 
I will never work again. In the most natural way, just like it's, he's got no control over the words, and the, the wife, and then the, the, it's a pretty big family, they're all like, and it just goes on from there, that, that's, that's just the beginning. He's got such a big love, such an explosive love. He's so connected that it just rolls out of, off of his tongue. And then, and then he's so welcoming. He's like, he's like Mother Teresa on steroids. He is picking up and welcoming in everything that moves, every child that moves. And when in Africa, there's a lot of children, and they and bring them in, in, bring them into the house, and and, and the, 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 his own kids. Are, but they dirty, they smell like hey, what this is, and they're, and they're playing and wrecking things and. Uh, a house that was pristine to just turn it into a jungle and he's just absolutely in love with every one of them. And so that's the kind of love, that's the way you undo the specialness. And the more that that family, the children resist him and, and complain and say we want it back the way it was and the past, we want the past to be the past. Don't think you can break out of it and everything. He finally just, he says, well, I'm obviously going to have to send you away to boarding school. He's going to welcome everybody, all the other kids, and, 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 and with the biological family, off to boarding school you go. Like, don't get in my way. <laughs> I got big love to share. It's, it's strong. It's strong. But see, that's the way. You you can't do it like this little piecemeal thing. Like, oh, did I say the wrong thing? I forgot to text and this and this. No, when the insights, when the when the love gets a hold of your heart, that's all she wrote. That's all she wrote, and the world, the perception will never be the same. Because you know, he's when you give your mind over to that, then it must be. It's the mind is so powerful that if, that all of the characters must begin to line up with that agape love, with that unconditional love. It's just like, I think he just has a realization that that whatever he thought was his purpose in life and the meaning of life was way too small, that he had it way, way, way too small. It's much, much bigger. And then... It just would dawn on him so strongly. Then, immediately, he would put it into action. Because he couldn't live with himself to just cower into the past, you know, to, hold, to cling to the, the littleness, to cling to the specialness. So that's, that's good. I mean, when Lion King is, the metaphysics are spectacular, you know, that's, that's a cartoon that has all the metaphysics and all the teachings of A Course in Miracles with it. That's what we're, that's our warm-up band. <laughs> yeah. We're going to use the Lion King like Pat Benatar to hit me with your best shot. Come on, Jesus, hit me with your best shot. Fire away! You know, that's where you say, Holy Spirit, bring it on. And this, then the second movie is, okay, <laughs> you want to see how it's put into practice, you want to see how to practice this big love, then watch, watch, just watch. Don't cling to the past, don't cling to anything of the past. Jesus is telling us we're worthy of God's love. And we're, we're so far beyond the specialness that he's like, why are you looking back? Don't look back. Don't look back. You know, what I, I, I want to show you the way things actually are. Like that song from Aladdin, I can show you the world, shining, shimmering, splendid. You know, that's, it, it is, shining, shimmering, and splendid. It is a whole new world. It doesn't, 
We are not stuck to the past. He's teaching us the past is gone. You are no longer bound by the past. You are free. You are free. You are free now. He keeps ringing the note. You're free now. You're free now. So just put your faith in what I'm telling you. Just, just put your faith in it. And that's the beauty of the movie. The church, you know, seems to reject him, his parents seem to reject him, his family seems to reject him. But those are just old ideas, Jesus is saying, like, do you think a loving God would create rejection, abandonment, betrayal? Do you think the, the God of love would, would create these these ideas, you know, and, and then when you believe in them, then you seem to draw forth witnesses to the belief. But it's not, that's not the end of the story. That's not, that's not the purpose for anything. I, th I saw this movie and I thought of that part in the Course, miracles fall like healing rain on a dry and thirsty desert. The signs of life spring up everywhere. You find around this man that deserts turn into oases, that, that frowns and, and hurt and anger and all the, the dark shadows just to start to light up all around the mind. He just, because of his faith, Everything lights up. Everything turns around. It's just a testimony to the power of the mind. Like, wow. Like the Bible says, if God is with us, who can be against us? That's what this movie's about. It's just about faith. I was watching the movie and by the end I was I could kind of look up and see Gandhi and Mother Teresa crying, Gandhi and, and St. Francis, bravo, bravo, that's exactly it, exactamente, perfecto, <laughs> exactamente, it's like that's it, that's it. The demonstration is just showing us that we have the answer inside of us and we can't compromise on that answer. We can't go for it partially. Yeah, when I saw this movie, I thought, Phew. I've counseled so many people when they talk about divorces or leaving their, their children and things like that. It's very deep, it's like a trauma, like, like a deep shame and guilt and everything. And I thought, wow, this movie is like, Phew, like a laser beam. But it's a laser beam of demonstration. He's not, he's not lecturing anybody. He's not telling anybody to change. He's saying, I will never work again. <laughs> he's just dropping that one down there. But you see, it's an I statement. And, and the depth of that too, yeah. That was more of, I will never work for money again. I will never believe in reciprocity again. I will be a giver. I will give like God gives. I will, I will give from my heart. People said, you're crazy. This is dangerous. This will never work. You're ruining the church. You know, this reminded me of, we just watched Jesus Revolution with Kelsey Grammer, you know, where he's, he was, welcoming the young people, the, the hippie generation. Oh, this guy is, is bringing in more than the hippies. He is opening the floodgates to orphans. Lots of them. Lots of them. <laughs> and the, the look on the, the biological children's faces, it's like, what the hell are you doing? You are ruining our lives. You are ruining our house. And he, he was like, I don't think I'm ruining anything. <laughs> he was just loving. But it was a demonstration. He wasn't, he wasn't preaching. He just wasn't preaching. 
It was just in action. He put it into such strong action. I think that's what drew people to Jesus too. It was, there were some words here and there, but it was more the demonstration than the action. It was a felt experience, even though they thought, I don't know where this is going, and I think probably all the apostles and everyone around Jesus was, was feeling like Ivan was feeling, most of the time disoriented, like another day of disorientation, like what is happening? This is so untraditional, this is the most unconventional man that's ever come along. Where is he coming from? And he's like, I'm coming from the Father. <laughs> Everyone's like, <laughs> if you imagine the rabbis, he should not be healing on the Sabbath. That is the work of the devil, raising the dead on the Sabbath. That's against the rules. That's against the rules to raise the dead on the Sabbath, you know. He didn't seem to mind. He, 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 he just demonstrated that, oh yeah, watch. <laughs> what is today? Oh, it's the Sabbath. Now watch. <laughs> watch me overturn centuries of Jewish traditions with one action. You know, that was demonstration. There goes the fireworks. <laughs> yeah. It's... I think it's more, it's obviously more in the practical application than it is in the, the, the ideas themselves. Because it's the demonstration that, that really teaches, it's not the words. The words are almost like just the, the forerunners, you know, like, get ready. <laughs> the words that were coming out were more like, get ready, are you ready for this? And then the demonstration was, whoa. What are we beholding here, you know? This overturns all of the ideas of the world. Yeah. Love your enemies, bless those who curse you. Somebody asks for your coat? Ah, offer your cloak as well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's lesson, or the, that's teacher of God characteristic number seven is uh, generosity. That's what this movie is, is really about. True generosity. Like from the heart, really. Start with nothing. Kind of feel like you're lifted up and carried and carried and carried. And then at some point, as things start to get prosperous, as the world looks a bit, seeing like, no, this isn't it at all. Prosperity and success as the world judges it, it's a trick. What most people put as their goals for what they want out of life is not really what is to be it's, Jesus says, you ask for far too little. The things that are commonly held beliefs of, around future and family and career and occupation, all those things that kind of is the driving force, is they're all part of a trick. And when you start to unplug from it, you know there will still be witnesses that are saying, you're wasting your life, what will become of you? Don't come crying to me in a few years when you're out on the street. <laughs> you, know, you know, that's the old, don't come crying to me. You know, there's a lot of that. And, and well, don't say I didn't tell you so. I warned you, you know, there's all the, the naysayers and everything. But that's what I like about this movie, you know, this guy. The naysayers come, come at him like flaming arrows. <laughs> He's just like, I'll never work again. I'll never work again. <laughs> you know, it's like, and he's just meaning, I, I will live and trust in the Lord. I will let everything that I need in this development of faith be given me. I will not, 
use my own past learning to uh, to try to handle this. You know. Yeah, you might even have to send this movie to your to your family. <laughs> hey, I just found a new movie. Thought you might enjoy it. Ha! <laughs> Oh, <laughs> it's like <laughs> yeah. Too hot for ego comfort. Burn that dross of past belief. Burn the dross of the past. Let it burn, baby, burn. <laughs> you know. That's it. With Jesus cheering you on, like he's like, yeah, burn, baby, burn, you know. I think there was a group, I think it was maybe in Africa, it wasn't maybe the, I think it was maybe the Hopi, or somewhere, the Hopi Indians, with some tribe that they basically, at the end of the year, at the very end of the year, when it gets to be Christmas time, the end of the year, they basically throw all their possessions into a pile and burn them. That's what they do every year. <laughs> they start the next year, they start to gain a few more possessions, but thank God it's the end of the year. The end of the year, burning bowl, burning mound, you know. <laughs> but it's just the opposite, you know. The world is accumulate and then get on for another year of accumulating and, and another and another and another and then you die. <laughs> accumulate, 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 die. Somebody wrote to me, they... I remember our friend Teresa Terry, she wrote in to me, she said, I was listening to one, or watching a video or listening to one of your talks and she said, Suzanne, Suzanne Sullivan came to me, like, come on, give it to me straight. Give it to me straight. What's, what is this seeming life that I have going to be? And I said, you, you want it straight? And she said, give it to me straight. I said, well, this is how it's going to go. Damn, 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 ah. That's giving it straight. <laughs> if you wrote that to the family, they wouldn't know what that means. Like, what? What does it mean? <laughs> But, but you actually live, you, you go through it, because of the letting go. The ego does not like letting go. Yvonne can tell you that after she came back from that eternity experience, and the ego was kicking and screaming and, yeah, screaming, literally. Screaming without sound, but, yeah, that's, that's the damn part. <laughs> there's, some, there's sometimes a lot of those. Damn, 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 damn. Ah. He says, very happy. He's got the tail. He's totally blue. He's so blue. <laughs> His tail's going like, yeah, yeah. Ah. Yeah, that's part of the grace of it. The grace is the invitation. As you go along, you, you can just say with, and mean it in your heart. You're willing to join me. You're willing to not join me, but my way is set. I'm on my way. You're willing to join me or not join me? You see, there's no judgment there. There's no coercion. I love you. I love you if you join me. I love you if you don't join me. I just love you unconditionally, and I'm going my way. That's what this guy did in the movie. He just, yeah. He went his way. And that seemed to put a decision point for his wife and for his 
in many his his pretty large family they were all put because of his confidence and trust and faith and that his way was set it was just in the discovery then basically everyone was free to either join or not join it was no factor there was no factor to it and i think that's why jesus just he presented an example and he and he said if you choose to think with me and decide with me, that's great, that's wonderful. And if you don't, if you choose not to, I'll wait. And I'm at the door, and as long as I live, that door can never be shut, because I live forever, with confidence, with the truth. So, I'm at that door, and I, I'm, you can come through that door with me at any point you want, and that door will never be shut. He's like saying, I guarantee it, I promise it, because I live forever. And that's the voice that, that has to pierce through the darkness that we, that we have to just tune into and say yes to. And then, then everything else, all the concerns about the form and how will it happen and all the concerns and worries, those just kind of fall, fall away like melting butter. They're, they were never the issue. The things, like Jesus says, when you have learned to decide with God, all decisions become as easy and as right as breathing. And as if you'll be carried down a quiet path in summer. It was only the decision in the mind that was difficult, seemed difficult. It wasn't the, all the form things. Yeah. I know Francis reached a lot of those decision points too. And, and when people would ask her, almost like with this incredulous thing, like, how did you do that? How could you possibly do that? And she would say, no, it really wasn't difficult. My, my way was set. I just stepped into the obvious. I just took the obvious choices and decisions as they appeared. But you're talking to me like I did some great, enormous feat, but it didn't feel that way. It felt like but of course, this is the next step. And yet it looked to the world like a path of letting go, of lots of letting goes. And, but she always, yeah, she would tell me, she said, no, it didn't, didn't feel like it. She would just join in prayer. She would always, I remember joining with her and it would just come to her so obviously what, what she had to do and then she would just do it. And that's what this guy does in the movie. He, When he tries to hesitate, he goes into enormous suffering. Enormous suffering. With just even an attempt to hesitate. Then he just, he just prays and prays and prays. He will, he will get into his car and he will drive without a destination. He will just drive and drive and drive because he's just praying and praying and praying and he's he doesn't know an outcome. He doesn't know a direction. He doesn't know what he should do. But he will just drive and drive and drive and pray and pray and pray and then and then sometimes stop the car and and face his own resistance, his own intense suffering. Of, of of saying no to something that wants to come through. And then he gives up and he feels it. Then there's nothing that can stop him. <laughs> he doesn't, you know. These are like words, family, huh. feathers in the wind to him. You know, these things that the world thinks are great. Even after an election when like a, when widespread violence breaks out, he's not deterred in the least bit. All I can feel is the love getting activated. I need to I need to help. I need to extend. That's all it does, you know, where others say, you know, it's dangerous, you could get killed. You know, he, he's activated. He's activated to help, you know. 
where others dare not go. Yeah. But that's that's what Jesus is calling us to, you know. He's saying be the light of the world. Don't hide your light, don't compromise, don't cower, you know. When we kind of hold on to the guilt and shame, we're just we're we're trying to make some kind of compromise in about our identity and we're just telling ourselves, I'm just going to play little, I'm just going to like fade into the background here. Nobody noticed, just let me go back to that little past one that everyone knows. And, and Jesus says, you will never be content with that. You know, you will never, you cannot play the little game. And when you cease to play it, it will revolutionize the whole perception of the world. It will shift you know, in a twinkling of an eye. <laughs> it's like Jesus singing a line from that John Lennon Imagine song. I hope one day you'll join me and the world will live as one. <laughs> He's just like saying, join my perception. Join my way of looking at the world. Join in the, in God's will. Be happy. You don't have to make excuses for your happiness. Be happy for no earthly reason. <laughs> That's the way to be happy. No earthly reason. Be like I said.